Okay, we're going to have a look at uh, a range of past paper questions that relate to questionnaires and interviews. So I'm going to be shortly looking at the potential answer for these two part question 4A, as well as looking at this particular question here. And what I would suggest you do is um, write your answers uh, to this and this question here too. Write your answers to these three questions um, and then listen to the rest of this tutorial where I will outline what the typical type of answers you'd be looking to give in order to achieve full marks. Now in this first part of the question, it's a two part question, but the kind of the core part of this question is this first part. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of using a questionnaire to collect interviews? Now, one of the main advantages of questionnaires is it allows you to target exactly who you wish to gather information from. So if you're doing a study focused on different age groups or genders, attitudes towards, in the case of this example, shopping, then you are able to target your questionnaires to specific people. And you can do so by actually visiting the locations in which you want to conduct your survey and then stopping people on the street and asking them the relevant questions. Another key advantage of gathering this as a primary data gathering method is you get to choose your questions and tailor your questions to your study. This allows you to get the exact information that you need in order to draw the conclusions that you're looking to make. Now, this does lead to some of the disadvantages because you are the person who comes up with your own questions for the questionnaire. You can often be blind to some of the things that you should be asking, but you're not. In this sense, you're only as good as the knowledge you already have and any preconceptions you might have about what people are going to say. And the problem this then leads to is that you might end up designing questions that only reveal part of what's actually happening. So the flaw here is it's your own bias can lead to you actually not asking the important questions that are required in order to really understand something. Another problem with doing questionnaires is it does require quite a lot of time and confidence to the person conducting the questionnaire. Because these are done face to face, people may be less inclined to wish to stop, especially depending on your gender um, and your age. And also the, the prevailing weather might also influence your ability to successfully conduct questionnaires. It's very likely that people might attempt to avoid you and therefore gathering a large sample is going to take a considerable length of time which might be problematic. Questionnaires can also have a degree of risk and danger because you're having to um, stop people on the street and that might lead to confrontations or people being rude with you who feel it's inappropriate you stop them in the first place. One final problem with questionnaires, which you need to consider, is not getting a representative sample. And this problem occurs because certain um, age groups and genders are less likely to stop. It's far more difficult, for example, to start get a middle-aged male to stop and conduct a questionnaire than it might be to stop an elderly female from on, on the street. And generally, people that try to gather data from certain age groups and certain uh, genders might have a problem gathering that information um, and might spend longer trying to fulfill that part of their sample if they are indeed, uh, that's important to the data gathering. So that's some of the advantages and disadvantages. You'd be looking to have at least two or three advantages and two or three disadvantages in order to be fully uncovering yourself for some of the advantages and disadvantages. And you might want to look back at the actual core notes that go with this to look at what a full range answer might include. Typical studies in geography that um, include uh, this, you could have a tourism-based study. Uh, with you ask lots of questions about people's um, spending habits in an area that they're visiting, where they've come from and why they're visiting. And that might reveal the typical tourist that's visiting certain locations. Crime-based studies also employ surveys. So these are people's attitudes towards policing and crime levels, potentially in an area that they live. Would be a second method for this. Transport studies also are typical um, studies that use surveys, people's use of public transport, um, or people's uh, driving preferences uh, could be surveyed across an area or between different areas in order to see if there are differences. So those are just three of the many studies. Your answer would have to be geographical. So if you were looking at people's, uh, for example, if you talked about people's voting patterns, you'd have to give a geographical spin to that. So you probably have to say across a wide area to see if there was a geographical variation in people's voting behaviors. Um, across a country, for example. And that would be turning something that's that where people often complete political surveys or questionnaires about voting behaviors, but you must make sure you turn it into something that could be 
regarded as a geographical type of study. Okay, in this next question, we are given a typical questionnaire and we're asked to consider, um, discuss what the students should take into account when uh, devising a survey of this kind. So uh, we're going to look for sort of four or five key things that we need to think about. Um, and the first one is, who are we going to target in our questionnaire? So are we going to look for a particular age group? Are we going to look for a particular ethnicity? Are we going to be looking at a particular gender? Um, and therefore, what is the demographic and makeup of the survey we're conducting? The number of questions is going to be a key um, thing that we're going to need to consider because the number of questions is going to influence the length of time it takes to complete the study, which will in turn uh, influence how um, many we get. Another key uh, thing is where we're going to conduct our study. Are we going to go to uh, the actual shopping location to conduct it? Or are we going to do this as an online survey? If we go to the shop, we're clearly going to be getting customers that are going there. Um, but that is obviously biasing our data in regards to they are actual customers already. But of course, if we do an online survey, we're not likely to know where the person's shopping um, and we may not get them returning the survey to us. So that's a, another thing we need to consider. OK, the structure of the questions is going to be a critical factor. So are we going to ask open questions um, with extended answers, which will take people longer to complete? Are we going to have mainly closed questions? Are we going to use a scaling system where we get people to rank things on a scale of one to five? Each different question type requires a different type of thing for the person to do and might be more challenging. So, for example, scoring um, using a bipolar scale on a minus two to plus two uh, for how much they might rank the shopping environment might be obvious to us as geographers. But for a person answering that kind of question, they might get slightly confused about whether the minus two is something that they should be regarding as positive or negative. So that's another key aspect to consider when devising a survey. Now, when we look at the second part of this question, describe what's gone wrong with this questionnaire above and what possible improvements we can make. We just quickly identify what are the key problems. Um, asking somebody their name might be a polite thing, but you certainly wouldn't want to write that down. And it's often not appropriate to ask a person's name anyway, because you have to think about, is it suitable? Is it relevant? Likewise, age can cause embarrassment with people, and it's very possible to classify people into age groups without actually having to ask the question. It's the kind of thing you can fill out after the survey has been completed as the person leaves you. Where people live, as with age, is something that you might be very relevant, but uh, where you live is probably better than if you just ask them for their postcode or the town. Um, it depends on the, the level of detail you need about whether people are going to feel comfortable enough to respond to that. Question four could be worded much better. Um, how did you get here? There might, there might be misunderstandings. Um, but if you think about how people are like to have got to a place, you might want to actually turn this into a question where you give them choices. Did you walk? Did you drive? Did you use public transport or other? That might then automatically classify your data and you'll be able to then do something much better with it back in the classroom. Do you come here often? Um, it's going to not necessarily, it's just going to get you a simple yes or no. That will be useless data, possibly. What you might want to do is actually turn this into a better question, which is um, which of these best describes how often you visit this place daily, weekly, monthly, um, annually, or some other um, category, which will automatically make them choose the frequency of their visiting. Likewise, with this question, this question six is better if you just give them some choices. Question seven's problem is that it requires a knowledge of uh, high and low order goods, which the person answering the question may not know. So a high order good is something that is bought infrequently, but of high value, whereas a low order good is something that's bought frequently and of low value. Um, so there's a better way of wording that in order to get the person to understand what you actually mean by high or low order goods. Is this a good shopping center? Well, the problem with that is that's a very loaded question. Um, so if you're asking that question, it might be, be much better asked as a scaling system uh, on a score of one to five with one being very poor and five being excellent. How would you rate the quality of this shopping center? Um, this is also a double question. There's two parts to it. So you're actually asking two things. It's likely the person might not answer the second part because they're too busy thinking about the first part. So it would be better to separate this question into two parts. So the why would be, um, depending on your score, 
Why did you give it the score that you chose to give it? Where else do you go shopping? Uh, it's quite a difficult question to understand because a person might say, well, this is the only place or I go other places. Um, you, you have to decide what is it you're actually looking for that? Is it whether, are you looking to see whether people shop in other cities or are you in other shopping environments, maybe within the city? So a better word question will reveal a much more sensitive data. Do you shop there because it's cheaper or nearer your house? First of all, that's a double question. Um, so that's not going to be appropriate. Uh, you want to split these two questions and you want to reword them better because um, you're really thinking about does how important the price of the goods being sold in this environment is to the shopper. So that's probably uh, the, what you want to consider in the way you word that question. The conclusion to this question is also inappropriate because it's not polite to say, right, that's it then. You'd want to thank the person for their time. And you'd want to write that down in your survey so it's clear that you remember to do that. So when I've, as I've gone through it, I've talked about what, both what's wrong with it, but also what you would do to improve it. Okay, finally, let's have a little look at um, this question here. Discuss the techniques that the student could use to analyze and process the question results above. The techniques discussed must include both graphical and statistical methods. Okay, let's first of all consider um, a graphical technique. So we could, for example, opt for much simpler techniques like pie charts or bar graphs to represent this data. However, they're very simplistic techniques and they don't give us an awful lot to talk about. This question here has got five possible responses that people were given to the question that we can see. So we could turn this into a radial graph with five spokes. Each spoke would represent one of these key answers. And then the number of people saying it would be the scale on that radial graph. This would very clearly allow us to see the difference between choice, which is the most popular, and environment and other, which are the least. If we then went to other locations in the city and did the similar survey, we would then be able to put on the same radial graph the, the answers given to that in the other areas. And this is assuming we've got the same sample size. Um, at the, each of the different locations. And then therefore we could compare the typical responses to each of these questions in these different shopping environments. We could also use a cartographical technique to represent this data. So where do you live? So we could use, as I'm showing you here, a sphere of influence map to show you where people visiting the central shopping center, which is shown here, are coming from, which are shown by the yellow dots and the shaded area represents the, the complete area covered by which people are visiting this central location. So where do you live could be represented using a sphere of influence, and it would then allow us to see what, how big the sphere of influence of that shopping center is. And if we have three or four shopping, center, shopping centers or shopping areas we're studying, we can see if they've got different spheres of influence. So that would be a cartographical mapping technique. Finally, a statistical technique we could use, because our data has been gathered in frequencies, we could use a chi-square for any of these categories. So for example, how do you travel? Well, it's very clearly to see that car is the most common. But if we've gathered from two or three other shopping areas, we could see if um, indeed there was a significant difference in how people are traveling to different shopping areas. We could do the same with, um, these questions and these questions. And the key here is that the data has been gathered in categories with the frequency of each. Now, the downside of this is that we have one category here with only one person, which is a limitation of chi-square. So for this particular data set, we couldn't use chi-square. But up here, we could, especially because the minimum required is five, and we do have that. And as long as with each of the other shopping areas, once we put their data sets together, we had at least five frequencies for each of the categories we could conduct a chi-square, and that would be allowing us to test if there's a statistically significant difference in the frequency which people visit different shopping areas.